No, no, he just said fall. Oh, it's got to be this. It's like a VFW. No, it's a VFW. Oh, okay. It's a VFW. But then you're in your butt. Yeah, yeah. So go to the three back to the boil. Well, we'd like to thank you for joining us here at the White Gull Inn for a traditional Door County fish boil. I just put your fish in in the second half of salt. About 20 minutes ago, I put a little red boiling potatoes in in the first half of the salt. If you saw the amount of salt, you might think, boy, that's a lot of salt. I use about a pound of salt for each gallon that I boil in. There's about 15 gallons of water, so if you figure that out real quick, that is a lot of salt. But you'll have to trust me, it'll flavor the potatoes and the fish just the right amount. <laughs> but the reason I put all the salt in there is I want to raise the density of the water. By increasing the density of the water, I do a couple of things. One thing, it'll boil at a higher temperature, probably 220, 225. Everything will cook that much more quickly and thoroughly. But the primary reason I want to raise the density is I want to make it sort of like the Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea, where you see people almost floating on top of the surface. Well, it'll do the same thing here. What it does is it forces all the fat and oil that'll cook out of the fish, and you can see it happening already. Floating, it'll float that much more readily on the top of the water, so that when the potatoes and fish are ready to be served, I can throw kerosene on the fire, not on the fish, on the fire. <laughs> it's just like turning it on high. Hopefully it comes up to a rolling boil, everything boils up, boils over, it takes all that fish oil and fat off into the fire, so that when we lift the potatoes and fish up, they don't get recoated with all that fish oil and fat. <laughs> You got about 45 pounds of fish in there, that's a bit of fat and all you want to get rid of. This has turned out to be a very scientific and high-tech way to deal with the problem. I don't know who thought of the procedure, but I certainly admire the courage of the first person who tried it. <laughs> Nobody really knows who started fish boils. We've been doing a large commercial fish boil here at the late since the late 50s. We claim to be the oldest. Notice I say claimed it is a disputed <laughs> title. However, I think, and most people believe fish boils go back much earlier than that. Most people believe they were probably started in the late 1800s by the fishermen as a way to feed a lot of people at things like church picnics or for community suppers. That tradition still goes on if you're up here during the summer when all the various little villages have their festivals. Somebody will be putting on a fish boil to raise money for something. I go to a 135-year-old Swedish Baptist church up here. We have a traditional Door County fish boil every August, and I invite you all to come. It's free. <laughs> However, it is our annual fundraiser. So. <laughs> <laughs> the other possibility is who started it here again, late 1800s, but probably over in the middle part of the state. Lots of lumber camps, lots of hungry lumber, lumbermen, lots of, lots of fish in the lakes and streams of northern Wisconsin, and a lot of wood. So it seems like it would have been logical for the cooks in the lumber camps to be doing something like this to feed the lumberjacks at the end of the day. We use Great Lakes whitefish here. It's all caught locally, and that's because this is a favorite area for Great Lakes whitefish. All the bays over on the lakeside, starting with Whitefish Bay down by Jacksonport, going right up the peninsula, Bailey's Harbor, Moonlight Bay, North Bay, Raleigh's Bay, and Sand Bay are all very shallow, sandy bottom bays. Great for swimming, maybe not this time of year, but actually that's the favorite spawning ground for Great Lakes whitefish, so that's why they're here, eating, swimming, and breeding, and that's why the fishermen are here to catch them. The way they catch whitefish, <coughs> if you go around to some of those bays, you'll see the fishing tugs that they use. Around here, those fishing tugs are pretty well totally closed. That's for a couple of reasons. One is because the weather and the sea conditions can be, oh, I forgot to tell people to turn off turn all off their, their cell phone. Devices, but anyway. <laughs> That's because the weather and the sea conditions out on the Great Lakes can actually be worse than the ocean at times. About three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, we had a blow here. They had 30-foot waves up on Lake Superior, and we lost hundreds and hundreds of trees around here. So it can be pretty dangerous out there, so working in a totally enclosed boat is a lot safer. The other is they fish for whitefish and other types of fish year-round. So since they all have a little pot-bellied stone, and they can crank that pot-bellied stove up, they can go out and work all year, all day long, and relatively warm. The way they catch whitefish is they'll motor on out in the morning and they lay out fishing nets behind the fishing tugs. The nets hang off of buoys at the appropriate depth, depending on where the fish are. And they, use, they locate fish just like sports fishermen. They cheat 
use sonar locators, find the schools of fish, and then hang the nets at that depth. They let them lift, <coughs> drift there. I can't talk tonight. Let them drift there for a while. While they're drifting, hopefully the fish will try and swim through the net or unable to, and they try and swim back out. They're also unable to. They get caught by their gills, and it's referred to as a gill net and gill netting. The reason that they use gill nets to catch white fish is even though white fish is a species of trout, has to be 16 inches long in order to be legally taken. They actually get much larger than that, but they have a very small mouth. About the size of the end of my thumb, or your thumb. <laughs> and that's because their primary food source is very small freshwater shrimp, almost like a Great Lakes krill. As a result, they don't respond to a lure or a bait, which is why I don't like to hear about sports fishermen going out after a bunch of whitefish. You can't catch them. If you're going to take them, you have to use a net. If you're going to use a net, you have to have a commercial license granted by the Department of Natural Resources. The Department <coughs> of Natural Resources also gives you a quota as to how much whitefish you may legally take, and you have to report all your catch to the Department of Natural Resources. Needless to say, our fine, upstanding, independent Door County fishermen do not appreciate the Department of Natural Resources meddling in their <laughs> free enterprise. <laughs> However, it has resulted in a very well-regulated and protected fishery, and there has not been a decline in the whitefish population like some of the other ones, most noticeably perch. Like I said, they let the nets drift there for a while, and then they lift the nets, they bring them into the back of the boat through the doors on the side and the rear, and if they've had a successful day, then they start motoring back into port. On the way back into port, they start processing the fish, cleaning the fish. You can always tell how successful a fishing tug has been as it comes back into port by the size of a block of seagulls following <laughs> behind it. Seeing <laughs> the parts of the fish we really don't care to. And actually, that's where I think fish boils really got started. Because you've got these fishermen who have been working, I should say hungry fishermen, who have been working out on the Great Lakes all day, coming in, cleaning this nice, fresh fish. Well. If they put a pot of water on there, as opposed to the pot of coffee, I'm sure they put on that pot-bellied stove when they went out in the morning. <coughs> and whatever they happen to get out of the garden, potatoes, onions, carrots, corn on the cob, <coughs> or more likely these days, what they get up to Piggly Wiggly, and that nice fresh fish, <laughs> they'd have a fresh fish oil at the end of the day. Mighty tasty there. I'm sure they did it at home. I always recommend you should consider trying it at home. I would omit the kerosene on the top of the stove, but you could just scoop out the minor amount of fat and oil that would accumulate with your minor amount of fish you're cooking. But if you think about it, it's actually a very healthy way to cook. Everything is boiled. It's not deep fried in oil. It's not sauteed in butter. And if you think of it sort of as a boiled stir fry, putting in what takes the longest, working up to what takes the least amount of time, you can use whatever vegetables you like, whatever spices and herbs you like, and whatever type of fish you like. Create your own very tasty one pot dinners. And speaking of tasty, <clears throat> if you've never had a fish, fish, fish boil before, but you have a taste for fish, I can pretty well guarantee you're going to enjoy it. If you don't have a taste for fish, I encourage you to maybe try a little bit of it. I think even though whitefish is a species of trout, it actually has a very delicate flavor. I think that's because it feeds so low down on the food chain, it just doesn't develop a strong fishy flavor. But I will caution you, if you have a problem with butter, <laughs> get over it tonight. <laughs> I used to work with an old Navy chef at Hotel de Nord whose favorite saying was butter makes it better. So if you think uh, boiled fish doesn't sound good, you'll find pitchers of melted butter on your table. <laughs> butter makes it better. We're just about ready for the boil over. We trust the assistance of rye. I got a glove. Is it me and you or you two? I guess. Yeah. Huh? Huh? If you're going to take a picture, you want to wait after I throw the kerosene under the hot count 1001, 1002. That's when the main fireball should occur. That's when you want to take a picture, but I wouldn't dally. If I do it right, it'll go quickly. <laughs> you ready? I'm going to put a little kerosene just around the edge to get it excited. When I throw the kerosene under, that's the time to take the picture. Nice. That was nice and warm. <laughs> <laughs> this way. Oh, it's the one, sir. Okay. 
Okay, you go one more time. You can go on this way. I'm doing it this way. Okay. Lift it together. Yep. Okay.